want to talk to you, of course, about the fine-tuned universe, as you can see uh, uh, from the slide here. And uh, the uh, topic is one that I claim no expertise in. Uh, my studies have been more in geology than in cosmology. Uh, but uh, it's one that I delved into a little bit. Uh, and I want to uh, tell you a little bit about what is <coughs> going on in connection with this. Uh, the program will be a little bit different this morning in that uh, I'll be showing you a video, a 28-minute video. Uh, and th these videos, uh, there are 14 of them. They have come as the result of uh, some work uh, I was asked by some of the leaders of Theox, uh, that's the uh, group that meets over in Rendell, uh, if we could uh, put something together. And these uh, videos were uh, produced here uh, in Loma Linda. Uh, these are not professional actors, in case you're wondering. Uh, and uh, they are uh, 14 s videos for the general viewer. Keep that in mind. Uh, this is not for the uh, technical scientists, it's for the general viewer. Uh, but it, it covers the subject, and I, I think uh, uh, since most of you are probably not that familiar with it, you will probably uh, be able to relate to it. Uh, before that, a, a couple of introductory comments uh, about uh, <coughs> the video and about the, the history behind this. this cosmology issue and the, the fine-tuned universe. And I, I thought I'd just mention just this week, uh, associated with this issue, there, there's been a, a trial going on. I don't know how many of you have followed it or not. It's been a little bit on the news, but uh, <coughs> it's not earth-shaking. Uh, there is a... I, I mentioned this to you about six months ago, you may not remember it. Uh, David Coppage uh, used to work at Caltech. And uh, he was uh, more or less the unofficial leader of the Cassini Project, uh, which is the uh, uh, probe we sent over to uh, Saturn to, to look at the various moons and rings of Saturn and so on. And, uh, he's been there, uh, oh, I don't know, about 17 years, 15 years, I guess, was the team leader. And in 2009, he was demoted uh, from being uh, the team leader. And uh, there have been discussions about his viewpoints on creation. Uh, he, he has a, uh, a web page, and it's a very good, very good web page. It's called... Uh, Creation Evolution Headlines, or Evolution Creation Headlines, I don't know which, but anyway. So. And uh, he, he reports uh, frequently on new discoveries and so on. And he, he's been a little bit uh, aggressive, I suppose, at Caltech about his viewpoints. Uh, and uh, he has, has sued uh, Caltech through JPL, Caltech runs JPL, uh, and uh, for being demoted because of religious prejudice. And uh, uh, in uh, 210, he was uh, uh, relieved of his responsibilities. Uh, and he, he's just suggesting a religious bias here again. Uh, what he did at Caltech was to talk about people, to people about several things, and uh, he's probably not a very quiet person from what I get. Uh, uh, <coughs> he, he was passing out this, uh, you know, the privileged planet. We've shown that video here a long time ago, the privileged. He's passing that, he was passing out that uh, uh, illustrious media. He put out a very good video. Uh, the privileged planet to some of the people and some of the people at Caltech were offended. And he's been arguing uh, there's no religion in that uh, 
video, and he's uh, uh, saying, uh, look, there's a difference between intelligent design and religion. This is his basic argument. Uh, and uh, what will happen, I don't know. It's, it's before a judge. The judge is going to make his decision. Uh, uh, he, uh, his lawyers accusing JPL of uh, simply uh, intolerance, bigotry, and ignorance for this. I uh, might state, I, I've been down to Caltech. I went down to Caltech once and uh, just getting permission for uh, publishing one of their illustrations uh, in our journal Origins and so on. And I happened to mention to the person there, you know, that I uh, believe in creation and uh, that particular person uh, really was negative about it. Uh, this was a terrible thing. I was a terrible person. Uh, that's just one sample. I mean, I don't know how the rest of the uh, institutions and so on. Anyway, he, uh, Coppage been suggesting, well, you should have a Christmas party, not a uh, end of the year party. Uh, he wanted the name Christmas in there and so on, so you get a little bit of a, a picture of what's involved in the issues and so on. Uh, JPL says, well, they repeatedly given him warnings uh, that he, he should not be so aggressive. Some of the workers were offended. Uh, uh, his lawyer says, uh, it's perfectly right to discuss political views and where you work, uh, and so on, and so uh, we'll, we'll see well, how the thing comes out. Uh, they're saying the suit is without merit. Well, we'll, we'll see how it comes out. Uh, <coughs> the uh, judge is Hiroshi, Hiroshiji. And he has uh, ruled um, first that uh, uh, Coppage wanted to bring in, or his lawyer wanted to bring in a wit uh, witness to tell the difference between religion and uh, science. And, uh, the judge turned down that request because uh, he says he knows what the difference is between uh, religion and science. and uh, He's making the decision, you understand. This is not a, uh, a jury. This is just one judge making the decision. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I guess he, uh, the Caltech group wanted uh, them to turn off in a video and so on when they were quizzing the witnesses from Caltech because they're, they're going to get a number of witnesses, I suppose, to say, well, no, th this man has been harassing us and so on, this type of thing and so on. And uh, <coughs> they don't want the religious views of those witnesses to be uh, available on video. And uh, the judge has turned down that request. It's going to be there. Uh, I haven't seen the video of the trial. I, 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 uh, uh, but uh, once it's on video, it's there forever. Uh, albeit, it usually get lost in cyber uh, universe or whatever. Uh, you know, it's so hard to find things. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the, uh, my take on it is probably a little a little different. Uh, this difference between <coughs> intelligent design and religion, I'm not as comfortable as some people might be with it. I much prefer us trying to answer these questions in the, in the context of what is truth. Uh, I say this simply because I, I know it is very possible intellectually uh, academically and so on, to study about intelligent design without this implying religious commitment to that designer. And that's what they're arguing. Uh, I think it's probably a little difficult to, for all these people that believe in intelligent design to claim there is no religious uh, bias in their viewpoint. Uh, I'd rather you go one step higher to the level of what is the truth uh, because 
we are complex beings. Our beliefs are complex. And uh, I think it's hard to separate those out. And I, I think one of the major problems at Dover, well, they tried the same argument at Dover, uh, separ <coughs> separating intelligent design from religion and so on. It bounced on them probably not because of what I'm saying. Uh, very bad arguments are given there. Uh, j just one other thing here, uh, last fall, uh, mathematician submitted a, an article is entitled, A Second Look at the Second Law. And this was in favor of intel intelligent design. Uh, again, what, what this fine tuning is all about. And it was submitted to Applied Mathematics Letters, produced by Elsevier, uh, which is a very, very uh, important uh, academic publisher in Holland and so on. And the preprint went on the net, and uh, some people defending Darwin objected to that being in that technical journal. Uh, Elsevier, most, they publish mostly scientific journals, if you know Elsevier. Uh, and so Elsevier withdrew the article. Uh, well, uh, and the, the, the uh, neo-Darwinians and so on felt they had won the victory. Uh, and they were saying, yeah, the, the article was not peer-reviewed. Uh, they must not have careful, done their work carefully and so on. Elsevier, of course, was offended about this. No, they said it was peer-reviewed. It had been accepted and so on. Uh, and they apologized for having done this. Uh, after having done all this, at least according to what I, the latest I know, they did not withdraw the withdrawal. If you understand what I'm saying. They had put, not put it back in the journal. They did give uh, the author the permission, you can go ahead and uh, put this on the internet uh, we'll not hold to our copyright on it. <laughs> they better not say they won't publish it. Uh, uh, you can, and so on. But uh, they have not uh, published it per se, which tells you a little bit. This is this big battle going on here, uh, of which uh, the question of, I don't know, well, I backed up a little bit here, I guess. Oops. Now what? Uh, which uh, this question of the fine-tuned universe is involved. Uh, books involved in this, uh, we mentioned some, uh, uh, really one of the finest uh, books is this one. It's uh, called The Anthropic Cosmological Principle uh, by Barrow and Tipler. Uh, and it, it's really good. Uh, you get towards the end, you better know your mathematics. Uh, it's all mathematical equations. Uh, that part, but it, uh, it's really good. Uh, another very good one that's uh, not that way, uh, avoids mostly uh, mathematical terminology, A Case Against Accident Self-Organization by Dean Overman, uh, written by a lawyer, incidentally. Uh, very good uh, argumentation. And then this book, not only from the standpoint of the fine-tuned universe, uh, he gets into the issue of the origin of life, which we're not discussing today. Uh, and then we've got this one, uh, Modern Cosmology and Philosophy by John Leslie. John Leslie, very prominent philosopher at present. And he's, uh, what this is actually a, a reprint of about 20 major articles, 20 major articles in this area. Uh, I mean, you get, uh, you get the whole history of the development of this idea which I'm going to get into right off here as we uh, look at this issue. Oh, I think this will work. <coughs> the history a little bit, so, so you understand what, what is involved in, in <coughs> this whole question of the fine-tuned universe. Uh, in the 17th, 18th century, we had the, the Enlightenment, you know, and this was, uh, Interestingly, 
as evolution reappears, uh, you know, it, it's been around, but as it reappears as uh, a, a significant discussion in the new world, uh, it reappeared in the minds of philosophers long it did before it appeared in the minds of scientists. And uh, we mentioned them, Descartes, Leibniz, Kant, uh, and so on. These folks are the ones that uh, started this idea of, you know, hey, uh, materialism is dominant. Uh, God starts being squeezed out of the picture. But in the scientific community, this did not occur till quite a bit later, about 1830 to 1900, uh, God was expelled from science. Before that, God was very much in science. And now, now we have uh, the interpretation of science without, without God. Then 1913, Lawrence Henderson, he, he wrote about the vertical properties of water that is so well suited for life. Uh, this is the argument from design and so on, uh, which gets into uh, the direction of this fine film universe. And uh, you know, water uh, has such a high specific heat and so on. So important for the temperature of, the, of the, our world and so on. So useful for dissolving things, moving chemicals around in cells and so on. Uh, so that, uh, there was some suggestion to this. But uh, the thing got more interesting. Uh, in 1959, uh, Sir Fred Hoyle, uh, interesting statement. Uh, Fred Hoyle is a little bit of a maverick. Hard to say what he believes. He claims he's not a Christian. He uh, sounds like a deist. He believes at least God started things. Uh, and, uh, but he, he makes this interesting comment. He says, I do not believe that any scientist who examined the evidence would fail to draw the inference that the laws of nuclear physics had been deliberately designed <coughs> with regard to the consequences they produce inside the stars. This is his specialty, uh, nuclear uh, synthesis in the stars. <coughs> He says, if this is so, note this, if this is so, then my apparently random quirks have become part of a deep laid scheme. If not, then we are back again at the monstrous sequence of accidents. In other words, he was finding so many things that seemed to be special, he was willing to say, well, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, some super intelligence has, has monkeyed with physics, is one of the terms he used to use. Uh, uh, and uh, he was in this, this area here, and uh, we don't have time to get into the story, Cal. Maybe we can later on after the video. But uh, at, uh, in his studies and so on, he made certain discoveries, uh, landmark discoveries, incidentally, in connection with the uh, carbon atom, uh, and so uh, we see this interest. And then a little bit later on, 61, uh, Dickey, famous cosmologist, <coughs> pointed out that certain ratios in cosmology, uh, they like to talk in ratios usually instead of figures, but uh, you can more or less use the same, you could say quantities almost, uh, hold in any epoch when physics can be there to observe them. Uh, this is where this uh, whole fine-tuned universe issue comes into the picture a little bit. Uh, in other words, unless you had these ratios, your physicists would not be able to observe these things. Uh, to put it other, in other terms, uh, if the universe was not fine-tuned, fine we could not exist. Uh, it's, it's called the anthropic principle, and uh, we'll get a little bit into that uh, here and so on. Uh, Brandon Carter, uh, this is the man that really broke the whole question of a uh, fine-tuned universe uh, open, in that he listed a whole bunch of 
coincidences, you might call them, fine-tuning of the universe and so on. Uh, and he called it the, the anthropic principle, anthropic referring to man, because they like to use this, this uh, factor that, well, if it weren't fine-tuned, we could not watch it. Therefore, uh, uh, there is an observer bias here. Uh, that's the anthropic uh, cosmological principle. If the coincidences are not there, we cannot observe them. Uh, and he had a weak and, and strong form. Uh, we must move on. Uh, Barrow and Tipler, uh, this book I mentioned here, they suggest four anthropic principles. Uh, the weak, the strong, the participatory, and final. Uh, <laughs> the weak says that uh, in order for uh, us to observe something, conditions have to be right for us. Emphasis is on the observer. Uh, the strong one is more or less the same thing. The universe has to be fine-tuned in order for uh, life to exist. Much a broader concept. It, it, basically, they're both the same. The uh, participatory, uh, that is, uh, goes to quantum mechanics uh, theory, I should say, probably. Uh, the idea that uh, as observers we, we influence what is seen. Uh, a little bit of like, well, you couldn't see it if it weren't that way, uh, type of thing. And uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, Einstein did not like uh, quantum theory at first. And he and Niels Bohr, Niels Bohr, the, the big uh, leader, you might say, in, in quantum uh, theory, uh, were discussing this. And uh, uh, Einstein getting at this issue, you know, of observer uh, uh, bias type of thing. Uh, he, he asked the question from Niels Bohr. He said, uh, you mean when you don't see the moon, it doesn't exist. And uh, Niels Bohr told to him, uh, well, Einstein, uh, uh, don't pretend to tell God what to do. Now, uh, I, I, this comment's interesting to me because, you know, God is included in the equation here. It's, uh, uh, as they're talking, per se, so. That, that's a little bit the participatory thing. Uh, I'm not enthused about it. Uh, final is that uh, in the future, we are going to be able to do everything. We're going to know everything. We're going to be able to manipulate atoms. We're going to be able to re repeat the position of atoms. Uh, we can repeat human beings. We can establish consciousness by building up the right kind of things. In other words, uh, science can do anything, I think. And uh, therefore, we'll have eternal life. This is the final anthropic principle. Well, uh, that's where we are on. Uh, on uh, some of these issues here, and uh, I'm going to see if I can get a uh, video started here. By Welcome to Where is Truth? We're so glad that you could join us. My name is Norm Peckham, and I have with me Dr. Ariel Roth, a scientist, author, teacher, consultant to states. We're so glad that you can be here with us. 
we're going to discuss some of the uh, aspects of our large universe that has to do with are we meaningful are we just a meaningless little thing out in the vast universe or is there something that might have more uh, specific relationship and a meaning that makes us meaningful where would we start such a discussion well let's first look at a few pictures Okay. of this universe that we have. Uh, here's a picture of the uh, Andromeda galaxy. This is one you can see without the use of a telescope. In, in the fall and the winter, you look up in the sky, there's this, uh, these four big stars, we call it the square of Pegasus. And, mm -hmm. uh, near the one of those corners you look and you can see this faint cloud there. That's this uh, Andromeda galaxy. It's, it's one of the units that we find uh, handy for referring to various parts of the universe. Uh, and it, these are rather huge things. Uh, we're familiar with our sun. Uh, Andromeda galaxy has something like a hundred billion suns in it. A hundred billion, okay. <laughs> and uh, it, it's huge, it would take light a hundred thousand years to go from one edge of that galaxy to the other. At the speed of light. At the speed of light, yes. Aye, aye, aye. Now, uh, when we come to our Earth, uh, we find ourselves in a different galaxy. And uh, it's a little hard to see because we're right in the middle of it. But here's a picture <laughs> of what we think it looks like. And it, uh, it, if you look at uh, figure A, you've got uh, you can see a very fine, narrow, that's because the axes are very flat. In the middle there, there's a kind of a bump there, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, supposedly one of these uh, black holes is there where uh, gravity pulls so strongly that even light can escape. Uh, that's why you call it a black hole. And then, yeah. uh, when you uh, <clears throat> look at the uh, lower figure, part, part B, uh, it's more of a surface view there, mm -hmm. and you can see the uh, kind of the black region in the middle, which is supposed to be the black hole, and then towards the side there, uh, you can see where our Earth is. It's on the side of one of those spiral arms that uh, comes out from the center, and uh, we, we uh, are just one of the suns in there. And again, here we're talking about maybe 100 billion suns. In, in our galaxy and so on. Now, here's a picture of some other galaxies. Uh, not all galaxies are spiral like the ones we showed you. Uh -huh. These are lenticular galaxies and they're the gray, elongated gray uh, splotches you see on, the, on that uh, particular picture. The, the dots that you see there are uh, stars in our galaxy and these other grayish elongated bodies or other galaxies other beyond ours. And we got all kinds of other galaxies out there in our universe. We'll mention that later on and so on. Uh, not all galaxies are spiral. Uh, some are irregular. Uh, <coughs> some are lenticular, as we mentioned in the last picture. Are they this generally about the same size? No, they're very greatly. They're very greatly, but uh, they all have a lot of stars in them. <laughs> Th this is a smaller, irregular galaxy, and so on. Uh, this is uh, another object we see in the sky. It's called the Crab Nebula. Mm, beautiful and thing. It's a very beautiful thing. Uh, this is the remains of a, an explosion of a supernova. It took place in 1054. Well, they didn't have Hubble telescopes then. No. It, you can see, I mean, these are the greatest explosions we know about. Mm -hmm. What happens is that a, uh, a star, uh, a large star kind of collapses, and when it collapses, it explodes out and uh, leaves probably a lot of neutrons, you know, a lot of things that we don't know for sure. But uh, this is the remains of that would, explosion. Would, a, would one of these things attract your eye if you were looking at the sky? Uh, not especially. Uh, I saw one in uh, 1987 in Australia. I just just was lucky. Wow. Th these things don't happen very often. 
Yeah. And I looked up in the sky there where there was an ordinary star. And there was uh, this brighter star there. They only last for a few weeks. Uh, and then they degenerate, you might say, into uh, this beautiful thing that we see here, mm -hmm. uh, per se, and so on. But it's just one of the other things that we have out there when we look in, in uh, the sky and so on. The, uh, this, this is in, in our galaxy. Then we have uh, comets. You know, these things that fly with a tail on them type of thing. Um, this is uh, Comet Wild, and it, it, uh, it's about three miles long. You can see the pock marks on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been hit and so on. Uh, they're made of ice uh, and soot and so on, and uh, their tails uh, tend to always be in the direction away from the sun because uh, the solar wind which are very small particles from the sun, uh, tend to direct it in, in that particular direction and so on. Uh, and here's a picture of one of our planets. So we're getting closer to home closer here. Closer home here. Uh, this is Jupiter, uh, the largest planet in our solar system. And uh, uh, this is uh, astounding. Uh, Jupiter is much bigger than our Earth. Now, look carefully at, at this picture. Uh, you see two dark bands across the middle. Yes. Now, the lower band, uh, and th this is a natural color picture, incidentally, which you, you see in Jupiter just the way it's seen. It's, it's mm -hmm. not been enhanced. Uh, and that lower band, uh, about the middle of it, the part you can see there, you, you see this red, reddish area below. A little swirl there. Yeah. Uh, that's called the red spot. Mm -hmm. It's, Jupiter is, practically all gases. It's just a, a mass of gases here. Uh, in the center, there, there's probably a, a mass of heavier minerals about the size of our Earth, but uh, uh, Jupiter is so much bigger than our Earth. How fast does it spin? Jupiter? It, uh, 10 hours, it makes a complete circle. What we do in 24, it does in 10. Right. And it's much larger than we are. Yeah, <laughs> very definitely. Does it go the same direction we do? Yes, Jupiter does. But that, that raises an interesting question. Uh, that is, not all our planets do that. Uh, Venus turns in the opposite direction. And this, this uh, raises a, a question. How did these things, were they formed by some simple mechanical situation and so on? Uh, because here's Venus going the wrong way. Now, as uh, I understand uh, it, mm -hmm. if in the Big Bang, if it had been spinning, then everything might spin, but it'd all be going the same way. Yeah, well, th th this challenges that, that, whole that simple model. Yes, I see. And Uranus uh, also spins the wrong way, uh, not quite as uh, perpendicularly as Venus does. Uh, it's, it kind of spins on its side. Uh, Uranus kind of points towards the sun uh, with his north, so-called North Pole type of thing here. Uh, but but in the, that red spot that we have there, uh, the Earth could fit into that. Mm. And Venus also, <laughs> they say, could go through that red spot. It's, uh, it's uh, so it tells you about how, how big this thing. And uh, there are clouds going around in that, in that red spot. Every six days, about, uh, the clouds make a circle. And people have been observing this thing for, for centuries. And it stays, stays just... Stays just uh, you know, at that same spot, these gases and so on. A uh, very fascinating universe that, uh, that we, we live in and so on. But uh, just a few simple facts uh, about our, our universe here. Uh, the universe is around, there's about 100 billion stars in the galaxy. We mentioned that to you. There's about 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. 100 billion seems to be kind of a popular number in this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big number. It's a big number. And <clears throat> our galaxy is rotating slowly, incidentally. Uh, uh, for us to make a complete rotation around our galaxy as the galaxy goes, and you know, everything goes together, uh, in this, it would take 250 million years. This, now, these are numbers that just boggle the mind. Uh, this is big and complicated. And, and the thing that really boggles us <laughs> is that you know, our sun is going around this galaxy, this huge galaxy, and we're going around the sun, of course. Yes. Uh, and our sun is traveling at 225 kilometers per second. 
and we were just traveling along 225 kilometers per second also. Well, but we were just traveling along for our son, so we're unaware of this. Uh, but we're really moving fast. That's 505,000 miles per hour. <laughs> uh, I tell you, that's faster than it's you. You get a traffic ticket on that one. Yeah. The universe is just immense. Just to fly by jetliner from the Earth to the Sun, you'd have to fly for 19 years continuously. Uh, very boring trip, of course. Uh, light from the sun takes eight minutes uh, to reach us. Uh, and light travels at around six trillion miles uh, in one year. And that's called a light year and so on. And it takes light 100,000 years to travel across a galaxy. These are, like we said, they're huge and they're big. What, what are the opinions of how it got this way? Well, uh, yeah, let me just mention this, the one thing, that, and that uh, the whole universe, as it's thought to be now, and this, uh, there's, there are questions about this and so on, because uh, it could be uh, uh, different interpretations related to the Big Bang and so on. The whole universe, uh, it would take light 15, 13 billion years to travel across the Earth. Some say several dozen times more than that. And so oh uh, anyway, uh, ideas about the universe? Well, some say it was created by God. Others say that it always existed. Einstein believed that for a long time during his life. He changed his mind later on. Uh, there's a steady state idea. That's the idea that uh, the universe has always been there kind of, but that matter is being created, man is being destroyed in the universe. And then there's the oscillating universe, and Einstein thought that also uh, uh, a little bit, uh, not very much according to that line, but recently people are thinking about that a little bit. That the universe collapses and then it's bang, you have a big bang and it gets big and so on and so forth. Uh, and then there's the, the traditional big bang idea, which, uh, it's been around for 90 years, actually. Uh, it's, it's an idea that survived in spite of the fact that uh, uh, there are all kinds of questions about, you know, how did it start, yeah. uh, the precision and so on and so on, uh, the precision of, of factors. It's unbelievable precision you have to have for the Big Bang to work. What, uh, <clears throat> what is necessary for us to be in existence here? Is it, there is that just we could be any place in the universe? Well. One of the things that we take for granted is that, you know, uh, matter is matter and so on. We don't realize that. If you look at matter, it is made of atoms that are highly organized. And these atoms have protons, neutrons, electrons, and so on in them. And uh, uh, some say uh, an atom has uh, 58 different subatomic particles in it. Wow. Uh, Here's a picture of some atoms in the, the uh, you can see uh, uh, the nucleus in the center there with protons and neutrons and electrons are on the outside. This is hydrogen, helium, and so on. Uh, our simple atoms are right there. Extreme precision is necessary for this. If the mass, we can kind of think of the weight, so a physicist would like mm -hmm. to use the term mass. If the mass of the proton compared to the mass of the neutron, these are in the nucleus, mm -hmm. if they varied by one part of a thousand, we would not have atoms like we have them. That's how close and precise these parts have to be mm -hmm. in order to have atoms. These atoms, you know, they do all kinds of things. They make light, uh, they make fleas, and uh, chemists, and uh, or whatever you want, uh, uh, galaxies, and stars, and so on. And th then we've got, uh, Another example of, of precision in carbon. Uh, carbon is extremely important element. You know, our bodies, have, uh, for, for life and so on, you have to have carbon. And, uh, and physicists, cosmologists have studied uh, uh, these various elements, and there are certain factors that seem to favor carbon that you would not have according to normal steps. And this has been worked out 
uh, quite carefully and uh, talk about the resonance of carbon. Resonance mean that things went just right for carbon to form. Uh, it's several different things. It's, it's uh, the uh, forces involved. It's the size of the target type of thing, uh, and so on. And uh, it turns out that carbon is a very favored element. And uh, some people say, well, God must have loved the carbon atom, uh, because the resonance is just right for the, for this to happen. So uh, we have this uh, uh, special factor for carbon. And uh, if this carbon resonance had been too small by just uh, 4%, or if the resonance of oxygen had been too great by 1%, we'd have no carbon around. It looks like that those various factors are all tuned to give us carbon. I see, like a well-tuned orchestra. <laughs> and then when we look at the orbit of the Earth, another, another closely related factor, you know, if the Earth were 5% closer or 1% uh, further in its orbit, we'd have no life on Earth. It's just right there in the right place. So there's a 95% chance that it wouldn't work. Yeah, but, but <laughs> you know, there's so many other factors involved that yeah. we could be uh, then we have the precision of the force of physics. Mm -hmm. This is this is really challenging, and this really caused a lot of change in thinking in the scientific world when uh, it was discovered how precise these forces are, the four main forces of physics, per se. And we don't have time to go uh, <coughs> very much into these details, but if we have a strong nuclear force, this keeps particles in the nucleus together. Mm -hmm. If that force were 2% stronger, we'd have no hydrogen. But you can't have life without hydrogen, or you'd have no universe hardly. If we were 5% weaker, we would have only hydrogen. And uh, the universe would be extremely boring, you know, and that's all you'd have, just <laughs> hydrogen, per se, and so on. Weak nuclear force helps in the sun uh, producing our, uh, our energy. And again, very important factors. This is, again, uh, a force that works in the nucleus. You're lining up a whole string of things here that seem like they have to be just right. Right. And then there's the electromagnetic force. And fortunately, that's, our light comes uh, associated with that. Uh, it goes beyond the nucleus of the atom, so, that, so we get light uh, type of thing and so on. But uh, again, it has to be very close or we would not have uh, the light we want. And uh, what would be the universe without light? Yeah, right. That, uh, uh, and then we've got gravity. And uh, uh, <coughs> gravity, uh, we're all familiar with. It keeps our feet on the ground, keeps water in the ocean, uh, and so on. Very weak force compared to the uh, uh, strong nuclear force. Uh, only, only one part out of 10 to the 39th power. Uh, it's, it's that much weaker than, than the strong nuclear force. These forces, they're precisely the right strength. They work exactly in the right place. Uh, and uh, the relationship is extremely, has to be extremely accurate. The strong nuclear force, uh, excuse me, the gravity and the electromagnetic force have to have a very close relationship. If, the, if it isn't close, uh, we would not have the sun producing the heat it does from the fusion of hydrogen into helium and so on. You, you've lined up probably uh, six or eight things that have to be just about right. Have, have people uh, calculated the odds for all of that happening that way? Well, uh, let me tell you first about electromagnetic force and gravity. Those have to be uh, <coughs> precise. Uh, in order for the sun to work properly, to one part out of 10 to the 40th power. Now, that's on, you know, 10 to 40, but well, we, we can deal with those figures, you know, but you, let me give you an example. Supposing we had a pile of matchsticks, okay? Hmm, matches. These are bare matchsticks. Okay. Uh, this is a pile. It's a great big pile. It's not only a million times the size of the Earth, it is a million times a million times the size of the Earth. This is a, a big spheral pile of smashes. It just barely fit between the Earth and the Sun. 
and it would take you 19 years by jet to fly through that pile. So I thought that's a lot so of matches. It's a big pile. <laughs> it's a big pile. <laughs> it's a big pile. Now, only one match in that pile has a head on it. And you're out there, it's very cold out there. And you want that match because you want to start a fire. There's a greater chance that you will pick that match out of that pile without looking than for gravity and the electromagnetic force to have the right strength. Oh, my. Now, you asked about combining these things. Roger Penrose at uh, uh, University of Oxford, he, t he tied these things together. Okay. He calculated all these things. Now, you calculate the probabilities, you've got to multiply them. He came up with the figure, what's the chance the universe came, could come together, you know, by chance? You know? The figure is one chance out of one followed by 10 to the 10th, to the power of 10 to the 123rd power. Now, let me simplify that just a little bit. It's one chance out of one to the 123rd power, at, at power of 10. That's 10 with 123 23rd. zeros after it? Yeah, when you state it that way, it's, it's got zero, that you have to have that many zeros, and every zero multiplies it by 10, you know. Three zeros is a thousand, six zeros is a million, uh, nine zeros is a billion, and so on. Uh, well, now, uh, what, uh, do the scientists have some idea that if it, the chances are so small that it's impossible, have they calculated that kind of a number? Well, uh, it's generally accepted. It's 10 to the 50th. If it's one chance out of 10 to the 50th, uh, you say, well, it's probably impossible. But this is 1 to the 123. Oh, oh this is way beyond that. Oh, my. Well, what have been responses to this? One response is, you know, well, the anthropology cosmological principle. This is simply the statement that uh, you ask, well, why is it, how, how, how come it's so fine? To, you just say, well, if it weren't that way, we wouldn't be here. Uh, it's not an answer. It's like being out in the desert and you have a, uh, an oasis and so on. And you ask, uh, where does the water come from? They say, well, if the water weren't there, the trees wouldn't grow. Uh, it's, it, it's not an answer. Not much of an answer. Another answer is, well, boy, maybe there were a lot of universes out there. All kinds of them, jillions of universes. Ours just happens to be the one where things are okay. But you can't measure any of that. That's just a concept, is it not? Well, you know, it's a frigging violation of statistical analysis because uh, you, we only know about one universe. And you could use it for, for saying anything you want to. You know, I could say, well, uh, the reason cockroaches have legs is because they, we haven't been in the universe where cockroaches have legs. Uh, you can prove anything you want to by that. It, it's, it's not critical thinking. Okay. Th then there's uh, the idea that fine, the universe has, has been created by an intelligent designer. And all this precision that we've seen, you know, I, I think fits best with that particular idea. The universe rests on a knife edge and you just alter one or two of these factors, the whole thing collapses. And then you ask for that to happen by chance. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, anyway, uh, uh, we can come back to our Andromeda uh, galaxy here again, and uh, it's, you know, it's a marvelous thing. Atoms, it's made of atoms. Uh, atoms have high precision. We got all these forces of physics, so important and so on. Uh, we have stars going around like our Earth and exactly in the right place so that we have the right temperature. It sounds like maybe there was a designer that was making things just right to place something there that was very uh, special. It, it, it looks like a very perceptive creator put these things together. Yeah. Uh, when you have such odd chances, it's time to give up the idea, well, maybe God doesn't exist. Uh, it's time to look for something that God might be uh, uh, the designer, and certainly the scientific data points to that. Things are so precise. So if you were to take a position in which God would be allowed in your paradigm, and you look at the scientific evidence, mm -hmm it gives some pretty good evidence that a god does exist. 
Well, I think the scientific data forces you to, to, to get out of the materialistic paradigm of science and say, no, that, look, this could happen. This could not happen. Okay. Well, it, we thank you so much for being with us. And here we have looked at a whole lot of different factors, uh, forces, that have to be just exactly right to very small precisions or nothing that we un understand or know about could possibly exist. Well, we're not through. We'd like to have you stay with us next time we come by because we've got some more searching is, as we look for Where is Truth? If you would like additional free information about these discussions, there is a PowerPoint resource available on the internet that covers many more details than could be provided in this lecture series. The resource is titled, The Bible and Science, and is available at scienceandscriptures.com. Be sure to add an S at the end of the word scriptures to get to the right web page. The Bible and Science resource follows the same sequence of topics as the Where is Truth series, but it is divided into 17 separate discussions instead of the 14 videos of the Where is Truth series. The title of the discussions, an introductory outline, and an index will lead you to the topics you want. The Bible and Science discussions served as the resource for the Where is Truth videos. videos uh, there on my web page you can access them uh, I understand I've not done it because I don't have that kind of a phone if you have these small phones uh, you can access it because it's on YouTube and uh, so it, it's readily available uh, problem is nobody knows about them the uh, I'm having to use my uh, control here to uh, Keep going. This is the web page. No. If you want um, to access it. On that web page, there's an S on scriptures at the end, and there's an S on sciences at the end. Yeah. Uh, you'll get away without an S on the sciences. I captured both words, but I, uh, the science and scripture one is already taken by another group. But uh, make sure you put the S on the end of the scriptures. Uh, you won't get to the right web page. Uh, and uh, beyond that, all I have to say, I think, is uh, well, we, we uh, I think uh, next week, and we don't know for that, so we, we I, I wanted to show you one other thing. I'm still on CRT is a problem, uh, cathode ray tube, and it doesn't show up on my screen there. But uh, let me see if I can do anything with this thing here. Okay. Uh, I wanted to show you one other slide before we quit. Uh, and that's, uh, well, let me get down here and put it this way. This one here. Uh, <coughs> I, I find this statement so uh, meaningful. The more I study in science uh, and the uh, more I look at things, I find this, this statement so meaningful. It's in the simple book, Steps of Christ, uh, Brown White. God never asked us to believe by giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, his character, the truth of him to his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason, and this testimony is abundant. Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. 
God is not going to force us. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. You're not going to be uh, compelled. You have to choose. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity. While those who really desire to recruit will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. And I, uh, that last statement is so true. There is plenty of evidence on which to rest our faith. It's so wonderful. We have such a wonderful God. Uh, that uh, whose presence and so on is witnessed by these things that we see in nature. So you folks have a good Sabbath. It's 11.30, I guess. So that clock is on, uh, apparently still on uh, standard time. Uh, so those of you who want to leave, I guess, I guess we have time for one question here. Is there arg is there argument about the, the necessity for the preciseness of those? Is that a debated issue? I've I've always heard that it has to be that precise, but I didn't know whether that's debated by individuals. The, the gravity and the electromagnetic force, all these things that are, have, is there pretty much uniform agreement that they have to be this precise in order for life to exist as we now know it? Um, Certainly, that, the one of gravity and electromagnetic, yes. Uh, others, uh, at least as far as we know, maybe not as precise as that one. Is that your question? I just didn't know whether people argue about the necessity of the uh, see, Most people don't get into these arguments because they... Uh, you have to know a little bit about nuclear physics, uh, which I don't know very much about, uh, for it. Uh, this 10 to 4, it keeps appearing in, in the literature. Uh, and and I, I've looked into the, the original articles by a, it's done in a Frenchman uh, and so on. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's evident, you know, if it varies more than that, you. you your sun is not going to produce the heat that it should for that one. Uh, orbit of the Earth, no, at least within 5%, uh, so on, so it, it varies. But uh, the, when you start multiplying these, this is where you get into deep trouble. Because, you know, it's when you multiply improbabilities, you, all right, which says when you add <laughs> add improbabilities, you have to multiply them. You know, you uh, throw a, a die, there's one chance out of six that you'll get a number five on it, for instance, you know. But if you take two, there's only one chance out of six that you'll get two uh, dice, if you want to use that term, uh, die, it can be plural singular either way. Uh, you get two of them with five on them. And three of them, one chance out of 216. Okay. Then you get into these huge numbers, you know, and uh, uh, the Big Bang adds some to it now. This is uh, Penrose, when he did that calculation of uh, one times uh, 10 to the 126th power zeros. Uh, that kind of, he, he included some of the factors in the Big Bang, and this means you have to assume there's a Big Bang, so uh, there are questions about it there to a certain extent, but uh, take any one of them uh, alone, you still kind of wonder. You start putting them together, it, 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 it's hopeless if you wanted to say, hey, that, you can't have just one good chance, one, one, good piece of good luck after another piece of good luck after another piece of good luck. I mean, pretty soon you get tired of thinking of good luck and thinking, hey, may maybe there's some intelligence behind all this stuff. I think one of the other points is on that, that supposing it were 10 to the 39th instead of 10 to the 40th, it really wouldn't make that much <laughs> difference. Well, that's for sure. It's a difference of 10, but then... Uh, when you deal with these big figures, it doesn't make that much difference. 
Yes, uh, you mentioned that uh, there were 100 billion galaxies in our universe. I was uh, reading Pixioni, Dr. Pixioni's book, and he, he mentions many other things that you mentioned here. And uh, he says that uh, the 100 billion galaxies is based on the what we can see today with our uh, uh, telescopes. Now, my question is, two questions. First, when you first started stu studying science, uh, was the estimate of a hundred billion galaxies in our universe, uh, was that the, the number for the number of galaxies in the universe? Because, I mean, we have powerful telescopes today, but mm -hmm. we didn't have them. <coughs> I mean, the telescopes we had uh, seven decades ago, when I was in school, I mean, we didn't have the telescope. So how many galaxies was the estimate then? And what's going to happen? What's going to happen if we get even more powerful telescopes? And are we going to say there are two trillions of uh, uh, galaxies in the universe? Uh, when I started studying this, the figure was on. And this is just, you know, I, I started studying this because I wanted to write this book, uh, Science Discovers God. Uh, and uh, at that time, it, it was, that's a figure that's batted around, okay? Uh, is that the real size of the universe? We're not sure at all. Is that the limit of light? And the universe is only, uh, we might say, 13 billion light years away. And, uh, light from further away hasn't reached us yet uh, is one thing. Uh, we're not sure about the limits of the uh, galaxy and you get into uh, uh, inflation, the inflation, and, uh, I mean more the expansion of the universe. Uh, some suggest, well, maybe our galaxy you know, is three, four times larger than we can see. And they're talking about our universe instead of being uh, 13 billion light years across, so maybe 56 billion light years across, and so on. We really don't know. We really don't know. But we do know the visible universe is, seems to be this size. At least that much is there. Now, so why do scientists insist on 13.7 billion years since the universe was created, because nothing moves faster than light. And the 13.7 billion is based on the idea of how far the universe that we can see has expanded. But since there is beyond that, we, we have no knowledge of how much bigger the universe is, then maybe instead of 13.7 billion years, that the universe started a hundred billion years ago. Yeah, well, that's why a number of scientists don't believe that figure of 13.6. There's a lot of disagreement here on this issue of the size of the universe and the age of the universe. But considering various parameters and connection association of the expansion and so on, uh, at present we're talking about 13. We're talking, we just talk about 15. So I, um, they tend to stay in that limit right now, but uh, you know, uh, you say cosmologists are often wrong and seldom in doubt. Uh, keep that in mind. It's uh, this is an area where this is not hard science uh, per se. It's speculation. I think one, one further observation on that, the age of the universe is separate from the size of the universe in the sense that if you project the movements of all galaxies backwards in time, they meet uh, at close to a point, and uh, Stephen Hawking and somebody else wrote a paper that uh, uh, showed that in fact if they get close enough they meet at a point. Uh, and that point is dependent on how fast mm -hmm. 
they're separating. <coughs> so that, that the age is actually pretty much there whether the time or whether the size is there or not. Perhaps I did not explain myself c clearly. If the universe is a hundred times larger than what we see today, that means there is not enough time for those galaxies in the farther limits of the universe to have started 13.7 billion years. Am I clear now on my question? I, I think so, but the answer is that if that's happened, then the universe has expanded faster than the speed of light. And in fact, inflation is supposed to make it go that way so that uh, uh, the amount of the universe that we can see may not be the whole universe, but that still doesn't change the fact that if you point it backwards at a certain point, yeah. uh, it collapses into a point. Go backwards, of course. Then you come to a point where they say the universe you know, is smaller than the Well, if we allow that the, the speed must, might have been faster than light, then I, I accept. But if we stick to the speed of light, there's no way to uh, accept that. Well, just go like Fred Hoyle does. Steady state universe. It's, uh, it's expanding, sure, but uh, or go go with uh, oscillating universe. It, it expands and contracts and so on. Uh, it's not an area where you can be very dogmatic, but it does look like uh, if it's expanding now and uh, so on to, to get to zero. It's around 13. But, but a lot of folks think it's a lot much more than that. They're they pouring out the factors associated with the Big Bang and so on. They think it's over now. I would just like to comment on the speed of light thing. <laughs> <laughs> you, were <laughs> you were just saying we don't know. <laughs> and scientists themselves are really... <coughs> Although they have accepted Einsteinian constancy <coughs> of the speed of light, there's a widely read book by Professor John McGuayho from Imperial College in London. It's titled, <coughs> Faster Than the Speed of Light. And he bases his conclusion on pretty strong data, and that is there are structures in the remotest galaxy which are so big that there is no no way that light could have traveled from this end of that structure to the other end. Uh, anyway, he calculates the, <coughs> the size of those structures so that speed of light mm -hmm. must have trouble f uh, travel faster than the, uh, the stated Einsteinian yeah. speed. And, uh, you know, just a couple of months ago, I think, uh, an article came out how, you know, uh, no, uh, we found particles can go faster than the speed of light. I think this was done in the uh, Hydron... Uh, CERN, wasn't CERN? it? Yeah, CERN. Yeah. And, so on. and then, you know, about a month later, they come back and say, oh, no, those calculations were wrong. So... Uh, well, one point uh, with the speed of light is <laughs> that uh, it's... Uh, inflation is already faster than the speed of light. So, although the speed of light may be the limit of what we can do at present, it isn't the limit of what everything <coughs> can do, which means that uh, to limit God to the speed of light probably isn't fair either. Are you, are you saying we cannot limit what God can do, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what, that's what Niels Bohr told Einstein. <laughs> Three weeks ago, I attended uh, a conference in Las Vegas on cosmology. And I tell you, there are a lot of very intelligent and well-informed physicists and cosmologists there for whom limiting the speed of light was an absurdity. So uh, I'm just reporting what I've heard very recently from some very well-informed scientists. We have barely scratched the surface on this question of uh, basic nuclear physics, matter, and so on. Uh, 
so much we don't know there. It pays to be uh, open-minded. I just have a question about this going back to zero and basing something on that. Uh, aren't you assuming the Big Bang when you do that? Yeah. And do we know that that, mm -hmm. that that zero is really anything real? No, I, I tend to agree with you. I better run. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, uh, Big Bang, you know, that's, okay, it's, it's called the ultimate uh, free lunch. Uh, because because you, you, you have to have everything so exactly. I mean, your, your uh, universe turns out have the right density and all this stuff, so it's flat. And uh, you've got this uh, uh, inflation has to be exactly right and so on. Uh, talk about figures one chance out of 10 to the 50th and so on. And on. We're not sure that the Big Bang is correct. It, it has survived for a long time. It, it, but, you know, uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, oscillating universe, and, uh, uh, steady state universe, so on, ideas that have, they're there. Uh, still, the Big Bang seems to remain the, the, the dominant one at present. Um, now, I'm trying to remember the speed that you said that we're going, I think it was 505 thousand miles per hour you mean we yes right the, well the I guess our solar uh, system or something see, it's uh, or was it our galaxy 225 uh, miles per second oh 225 miles per second we're doing right now yes oh I, okay it, was it kilometers oh. kilometers per second okay 220 ah uh, so you know we're merrily traveling along here. Um, so my, my other comment was something you mentioned earlier about, it's always annoyed me, uh, where they say, uh, these, these people where you started before the film, uh, the, so many people getting offended. Uh, personally, I'm offended by them being offended because I don't really believe they're offended in the first place. I think they're just trying to propagate their beliefs and they mm. don't want to hear the other beliefs, and uh, I've never heard anyone say that, but I just don't buy it, you know? I think they're, they're trying to sell their beliefs, and it shouldn't really be about religion as much as beliefs. They want to propagate their beliefs, and maybe we want to propagate ours, or at least argue the, the points, and they don't want us to argue <laughs> the points. <laughs> you raise a very basic question, of course, here, and that is, how do you relate to these controversies that become so emotional that uh, emotions supersede truth. And uh, this is, uh, you get in a very dangerous area there when you, when you do this, and uh, this happens on both sides of these issues. Yeah. It's a two-edged sword here, and uh, we need to be very careful about being about integrity in data, we need to be very careful about uh, uh, understanding. And uh, we, I, I guess the best thing I can say we need, we need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Um, if you look at uh, oh, take the metaphor of law, the opposite or the other side of the coin of law is grace, law and grace. Mm -hmm. um, if I have law not balanced with grace, you would call me a legalist. If I have grace not balanced with law, grace that doesn't lead me <coughs> to be a law keeper, you would call me too liberal. And by analogy or by parallel thinking, um, if you have somebody who believes in the laws of science, so-called, um, in other words, an evolutionist, um, they are going to right shift you over into what would be analogous to the legalist. Uh, they think we are just nitpicking about 
biblical stuff that's just ignorant and out of date and old fashioned um, because they think they are in the center of the um, th they think that that they are in the center where the truth is and if if we're not where they are then we can't be proposing truth we must be over there on the um, far right let's say uh, where you're just ignorant whereas those of us who believe in the Bible and God um, we think that we have the truth um, and we certainly have plenty of evidence for it such as you've presented this morning um, but we also see we do the opposite with the evolutionists <coughs> we see them on the other side as um, being at, at an extreme that does not is not open to the truth mm -hmm. and so it does boil down to um, are we willing to consider not only evidence but our own heart which is the grace side or the some would say right brain side mm -hmm. of the equation um, we have to be willing to recognize that there may be prejudices that we need to be open um, <coughs> to what the evolutionist says but they need to be open to what we say and to me it comes down in the final analysis to a balance between I've looked at the evidence my heart is open to God I'm willing to accept what he says I'm willing to accept good science <coughs> that backs up what he says um, but it's 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 the the heart must rule over the head because it's really a spiritual battle in our heart. Thank you. Uh, we need balance here, but I uh, I would say it helps me to try and think in terms of God's redemptive attitude, how we relate to these issues. Uh, they always get in these ad hominem things. They accuse you instead of addressing the issue, the argument. Uh, and it's all over the place, you know. Uh, he's not fair and so on. They don't, they don't address the real question which they can't answer uh, type thing. But think in terms of God is trying to save every one of those persons. Be it uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, I hope someday will become a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, to everybody else. Uh, what can we do to fulfill God's purpose? Now, sometimes their errors have to be pointed out. Uh, I think that's, uh, you need the balance. You need that balance, but uh, uh, try and think of it in terms of what, what does God want for those people? Well, I, I try to think that way. Uh, the other comment that you started out with uh, talking about the, the court case and such, the, uh, I, I, would I, I would fully agree with you about the, uh, what I feel anyway, about the intelligent design argument. I think it's uh, the judge and many people, most people perhaps, might look at intelligent design, the, the um, uh, phrase intelligent design as relating really to God you know it's it's like almost saying the same thing whereas of course with truth you know mm -hmm. that's too universal you cannot mm -hmm. tie it to any specific thing because it's just truth it's it's like stands alone yeah so um, I don't know hopefully it'll work out something for the best but when is when is this supposed to conclude or is it I know sometimes these things can take years, perhaps, but in court, it's, this is going on right now, you said. Say so what's going to happen there? The, the court, when is it gonna, supposed to conclude or when? Oh, I have no knows? idea. This is uh, ongoing. How long it's going to go on. Uh, yeah. It sounded like it was still going Thursday, but that's all I know. Oh. Uh, anybody else have it? Uh, I have no idea. Depends on how, when they get tired of arguing, I guess. Uh. 
Well, they're actually, gonna have, they're going to have a number of witnesses from Caltech witness that this is he's aggressive. I, I mean, if you just take the word intelligent design for face value, it it, it doesn't really say God. So, but uh, you know, with human beings, uh, may, maybe part of the problem is that what I was thinking earlier with it. We're traveling so fast, everyone's kind of a little dizzy and doesn't think quite um, right. You have difficulty Perhaps. finding anybody who believes in intelligent design that doesn't have a religious life uh, because the facts tend to compel you into a religious mode, I think, a little bit. But I think, uh, rationally, I think it is possible to separate those two out. Uh, practically, I'm not. I haven't seen a lot of examples of it. Yeah, it's uncomfortable having to rely on this one man sitting up on the, uh, on this big behind this big desk with a, you know, mallet to, to pound out a, a decision. But anyway, he's, he's going to make the decision. It's, it's a one, one judge trial. He want uh, Copage wants, I think, remuneration for. Uh, what he's done, he's, I don't know how extensive it would be. Uh, he wants them to pay the lawyer fees. And he wants a judge to admit that there was prejudice. That's what he's requested. Uh, you said that uh, you were hoping that uh, some of these scientists would become a, an Adventist. No. I was reading this week mm -hmm. the story of Manuel Noriega the dictator, former dictator of Panama. Amazing story. How Sama, an Adventist, decided to go and tell him, he was in jail, he went, decided to tell him that God loved him. Mm -hmm. And he gave him a book written by a lady we know, Ellen G. White. Mm -hmm. And he read this book, read another book, and got baptized. He's a seven-day Adventist now. So what, are, what am I doing to get this scientist to become an Adventist? N never give up. Never give up. Um, I like to think that God is so fair and loving that he gives us wiggle room to believe in him or not at a heart level that he doesn't give us so much evidence that we have to believe he gives us enough that faith can rest on that evidence and choose to believe if we're really willing to be under his control and realize that it's the most benevolent control that is possible. I, I have questioned whether a great controversy uh, would not be uh, extended forever if God did not allow freedom and sin to mature to the chaos that you expect at the end of the world. Uh, so I, I'm grateful that it's that way, otherwise maybe it might never end. I think there's enough evidence for the evolutionist to believe that he has the truth mm -hmm. if he wants to believe that way. Mm -hmm. But if his heart is willing to see the other side, yeah. then the Lord will show him that if he's willing to search it out. I have a question. I hardly know how to ask it. Um, in the Bible, God is self-existent. Is it possible that the universe and God are self-existent together? That they existed without together? Together. From the beginning? From the beginning. Whenever we don't know when that is, if God has been uh, self-existent. Uh, I suppose you could do that, but I would want you to, to insert a space-time warp in there, in quantum, in the relativity. Okay, uh, then the other question would be, if God is, part of his character is creative, which 
we are led to believe by reading the Bible, then part of the universe is always being created? Is that part of God's character? Could be. Could be. We don't know. And the reason I inserted this time-space work is that uh, God is eternal. And we, we have, it doesn't fit in our present uh, thinking of something, anything being eternal forever. You know, you just go back and you have to go back some more and you never get to uh, a beginning. But uh, that's I, because... I, I, think, I think that's simplistic thinking. Well, I'm uh, very simplistic. Uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, I'm not saying you. <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I think when we need to think, there's a reality beyond this ordinary cause and effect. Uh, and I think uh, quantum theory seems to uh, substantiate. There's so much we don't know there yet. That we need to go beyond that. Well, I agree with that. I just think that the possibility of prayer goes faster than anything else. So. How come we can't believe that God's creative power can change at any time and it will be within the realm of reason? And that some things go faster than the speed of light. Yes. Yeah, very well, definitely. Prayer's one of them. Very definitely. <laughs> so I, you know, I just was curious and wanted to ask. Yeah. Uh, 